Again, let me just say how uh, refreshing it is uh, to just open our Bibles tonight with one another and look to the Lord as to what He has to say to each of us tonight and just reflect on His Word. Let's open up with a word of prayer tonight as we begin our Bible study, if we would. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, Lord, for your love in our life, for your kindness. And Father, thank you for being here with us this evening. And Lord, as we embark upon your word and your truth, we ask that you would simply reveal yourself to us more clearly. Show us who you are. Show us about yourself, Lord. Father, draw us closer to you. Give us a deep desire for studying your word, for knowing it. Lord, not only to give an answer to every man that asks us of what we believe, but Lord, we simply want to have within our heart uh, an understanding of your love for us. And so, Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we pray for many of those that are not able to be here tonight. Lord, also press upon the hearts of many uh, to come to know you, to know your word. Father, we simply remember them and think of them tonight. Lord, guide us now in the study of your word through your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 2, John chapter 2, and we're going to start just rereading verse 5, John chapter 2 and verse 5. And we read, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill up the water pots with water. They filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. <coughs> when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made of wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, when men have well drunk, and that which is worse, thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Uh, the Jews, we know, used stone water pots uh, to hold all the water that was used for the ritual purification. Uh, and the reason behind that is to not let any dirt come into those pots and contaminate the water for purification because uh, unlike earthenware pots made from mud and dirt and so forth, uh, based upon passages like Leviticus chapter 11, the stone would keep, again, uh, the water purified and keep it from becoming unclean. Uh, my children often will go out back and play in the red clay this red clay that we have here in Virginia, uh, to make little tiny dolls <laughs> and little tiny uh, figures of miniature people. And then they will set those little dolls or whatnot in the sun to bake, and they become very hard, as hard as a brick. Uh, we know that Thomas Jefferson, when he was about 25 years old, he would do the same thing with bricks. That's how he would construct and create 
uh, many of the architectural designs of his own. Of course, it took him about 40 years to complete it, <laughs> whereas today we can get up a home in no time. Uh, but, and also his Monticello Garden, we know that he moved some 600,000 cubic feet of this Piedmont red clay and he did it by just a mule and a cart, and they did all this by, by hand, and he created that hanging garden that you go to see there, which is quite a spectacle. Uh, but, and it's funny because our red clay is usually too dense for uh, agricultural purposes, uh, but there in Monticello, it's actually loamy, and it's rich in iron, which allows, uh, you know, for a good garden, and this is what Thomas Jefferson used to experiment all sorts of different vegetables. I like reading about Thomas Jefferson and about his gardens and uh, just he was really uh, caught up with Mediterranean type plants and almonds and so uh, such forth as things like that. And so uh, this red clay is, is similar in the sense that if we made a pot out of it, it would, the water would be contaminated. It would be just like red mud. And even in Jesus, uh, his time, unlike the uh, Samaritan woman and the pot that she used to draw water uh, from the well that we'll come to in chapter 4, uh, these here at this wedding were large pots that contained up to 20 to 30 gallons of water. And the reason being is they needed that much water to accommodate for the large celebration and the large festival and the wedding that they were having. But also because we notice in Mark chapter 7, it talks about that they would use the water for cooking and eating utensils that they would wash in this water. Uh, not only that, but we also are aware of the fact that they would use it for uh, cleansing the wedding guests through ceremonial, uh, ceremonial purification. And so... Again, the Jews, we know they demanded close attention to personal hygiene, and so they always had uh, water on hand, and much of it. Here is Mary, as we've already indicated, and she is having faith, she's having confidence in her son, Jesus, and says to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And Jesus, notice in verse 7, replies, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim, which means either they topped them off with water, or they emptied what was there and refilled them. Uh, and it's, it's obvious at this point, we need to point out, that, uh, that there was nothing but water in those pots. So don't believe for a minute that somebody came along secretly and poured some wine in there. Uh, still, it would even be so diluted by all the amounts of water. Uh, this is indeed a miracle that Jesus does. In verse 8, he says to them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast, which we would call today probably the, uh, the master of ceremonies, when he had tasted the water that was made wine, in other words, he would be the one who would sample the wine, he would taste it, and when he did so, he realized it was wine, but not just wine, he says in verse 10, it was good wine, which means it was the best, sweetest Freshest that the master had tasted at this feast. And the master was amazed, we're told, uh, because the host, he goes on to say, usually served the good wine first and then would resort to the cheaper stuff later in the celebration when people uh, largely had their fill. And again, we're talking about a large amount of wine. Probably somewhere between 120 to 180 gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine. That was more than enough for the rest of this celebration. So look, not only did Jesus 
rescued the bride and the groom from an embarrassing situation, but also Jesus made them enough for a wedding present at the end that they could have. I don't want to take much time to deal with this, but I know you're probably questioning your mind and wondering because some have already expressed to me trying to figure this out. Wait a minute. I mean, if there was this much wine, wouldn't they have been passed out? Wouldn't they just been drunk? Wouldn't this turned into some, some drunken party with everyone passed out or something? Well, let's take it based upon the context here. Uh, because according to verse 10, the word drunk, that is when the ruler of the feast says, and when men have well drunk, it does in fact in the Greek mean to become drunk. Uh, this is the Greek word uh, methusko. But remember that the ruler of the feast is the one speaking. And so this is the general practice uh, back then that he would normally see, that he would normally uh, watch at these weddings. However, it does not mean that this particular banquet became just that, a drunken party. This is the head waiter speaking from his own experience here. So we need to note that. But the verb in the Greek, methusko, does in fact, which is first aorist passive subjective here in the Greek, does tell us and imply to us it means that these guests were not drunk. That's not what it says. That they were drunk and they, Jesus made a bunch more wine and they all got drunk. That's not what it says. Instead, we know it was the common custom to put, as he said, the worse wine, the less wine, the inferior wine, last. Uh, even the word oinos, which is the word in the Greek for wine, here does refer to real wine. But it does not imply anything about fermentation. So let's understand this, that this fact does not mean today, we're not saying by any means that Jesus would approve of our, you know, our modern liquor trade within our day. It's not that at all. A man at this wedding could have drunk as much of this wine and never had a bad reaction to it. A person could have drank from the wine that Jesus made as much as they want to never become drunk. But secondly, remember this, that Jesus made this wine. Many times we forget that. He was the one who created the wine. In other words, what I'm saying is this particular wine did not come from the normal process of fermentation, where you have, you know, the grapes, the vines, and the earth, and the sun, all of that. We are told here that the Lord brought this into existence from nothing, from nothing. And remember, that's the focus here, that it's, it's, it's about his miracles, and not just his miracles. It's not just about, you know, what type of wine it is here. It's not about even just meeting the human need and saving a family from social embarrassment. Uh, unlike the other Gospels, what John is communicating through the story by recording this is by pointing us to the inner meaning or the spiritual significance of Jesus and his word. And the reason he's trying to do that is, again, to convince us of his deity, that he is the Son of God. So realize that this miracle not only impressed you know, the ones that were filling up the wine, filling up the water, watching it be turned into wine, but it impressed his disciples and it revealed, as we've indicated many times already through chapter 1, it revealed his glory. That's what we're here to see. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 even tells us that all things were made by him. Remember, that was John's introduction to his gospel. And I mean, Jesus had to begin somewhere with them, right? He had to start some with some miracle with his disciples. 
It wasn't just enough to get the people to see the miracle and to believe in his words. He had to take it a step further, which is to believe in him as Savior, as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as the one who was sent from the Father above. Which explains why Jesus often would add a sermon, by the way, to each miracle that he did. We see that. He would perform a miracle and he would uh, also have a sermon or a message behind that miracle that he performed. Because it was simply an open message about his deity. And I often wonder here uh, if the Lord had a sermon that he was going to give for this particular miracle of turning the water into wine, what might he have said? What might he have communicated to his disciples? Well, I think we know. I think we know what he would have said. For one, he would have likely said, look, the world's joy that they offer, it never satisfies. I think that would be clear. What the world tries to give to us, it doesn't last. But he would clearly say the joy that I can give to you and grant to you by giving you a new life is everlasting. It will give you peace. It will complete you. It will be fulfilling. So look, the symbolism here that we see is this, that in the scripture, wine is a symbol of joy. There's no doubt about it. But what is also true is that what the world tries to offer us is sort of like the first wine that they would offer in the wedding, right? The worst, the last. I know the world tries to come across as what it has to offer us is the best. But then once you experience it, once you taste it, <coughs> once you've had your fill of it, you realize it's actually worse. We've all been there. Where it gets you to the point that you taste so much of what the world has to offer that you realize it's not satisfying. It doesn't fulfill. It doesn't completely make you joyful. But of course, what Jesus continues to offer us is what's best. What Jesus offers us is fulfilling. What Jesus gives to us is truly the sweetest blessings like that wine will be until the eternal kingdom comes. And look, secondly, I believe the Lord, if he gave a sermon at this wedding, what he probably would have also said is, he would have said, you're like Old Testament Israel. Uh, you are pictured as married to God. We see that time and time again in the Old Testament where Israel is pictured as being married to Jehovah God. And I think he would say, you have been unfaithful to your marriage covenant. Uh, we read such as pass passages like Isaiah 54, 5, uh, Jeremiah 31, 32, Hosea 2, 2. And it gives us this picture where Israel continually, through their disobedience to God, becomes over and over again unfaithful and remains in that state. And they had been in that state for some long time. And just as the wine runs out at the wedding. I think Jesus would say, you, Israel, have ran out of options. And you, too, are just left with these, like these six water pots here at the wedding that are empty. You, too, are empty inside. That's what he would communicate. Remember, these water pots, yes, they held the water for things like external washings. But I think Jesus would say, look, what you need is not external washing. You need internal washing and cleansing. What you need is permanent joy. And only I can provide that. And just as I transform this water into new wine, I think Jesus would also indicate that I'm pointing to myself. And I think he would tell them and the disciples that I can offer you a complete new change. Now the wine would point to his own life-giving blood. So there's new symbolism in this wine. 
This new wine is to be symbolic of what we even do at the Lord's table when we remember this juice as being the very blood of Jesus Christ who gave his life for us, who gave us this transforming ministry or this transforming life. Like Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the glorious thing about being a Christian and being in Christ. Is that all the things that I've done in the past, the Lord has forgiven. He's forgiven me of my sin. And that all that is ahead, I can look to Him and trust in Him and rely upon Him. And He has made me a new creation. And I can serve Him in that capacity. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 17, weeks ago, we, we mentioned that it says, For the law came through Moses, but grace and truth, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So understand, this was the beginning of the disciples learning who He was and what He could do for them. And even though they would put their faith in him, it would continually be tested over and over again. It would be continually developed through their ministry. And he would continue to reveal himself as the Logos, the Word, the Word. And, you know, the disciples, even though they did not at this point understand the death and the resurrection that would take place, they didn't understand that yet. But what they did through this marriage, this ceremony, they would understand and see the power of Jesus Christ. They no doubt saw that much. So look, this is the first sign explained by John, which clearly was meant to be a manifestation of Christ and his glory. It was designed to convince his disciples that he was all that he claimed to be, the Word. Creator. Only the Creator could create wine just like that, to make gallons of it, of good wine. So this was a joyous occasion because really it was a gracious indication of the joy that He provides, and that He gives to us. That was the point. That was the focus. And that is exactly what Jesus can provide to us as well. And then in verse 11 it says... <clears throat> this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Verse 12, after this, we're told he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there many days. Uh, this is a figure of speech that we know is called as a polysyneton. And a polysyneton is basically, or ton, is a list uh, that is repeated by words that are interconnected and related to one another. Here they're connected by the word, notice, and, the word and. And it's intended to draw our attention to each member of the party and his brethren and his disciples. Okay? So it's drawing our, our attention to them. The brethren, by the way, mentioned here, who are Mary's children. Okay? This is not the immaculately conceived Mary who was sinless. The Bible does not teach that. Verse 13 and 14, notice, and the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. Not just because they enjoyed counting their money, sitting there like Scrooge or something, but they were changers of money. What they were changing the money from was from Roman coinage to Jewish coins, Jewish money, in which the temple dues had to be paid in Jewish coins. Jesus 
his mother, John never calls her Mary, his brethren, we're told, his disciples, they all are on the move to Capernaum, which was on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. They go there for a few days. And even though Capernaum is northwest of Canaan, Cana, uh, they are, we're told, going down. What do you mean? Well, down in the sense of uh, the land as the elevation went towards the sea. They're going down, it tells us. And so we know that Capernaum becomes Jesus' home base. This will be his headquarters. This is where he, in fact, takes up residence. Yet on this particular occasion, he would only remain there for just a, a short time. Since it was, we're told, the annual Passover feast, which is, by the way, first the first mention of the three that John will tell us about regarding the Passover. Now, the annual Passover feast, we know, is a commemoration of Israel uh, and their exodus from Egypt. And in fact, on the Passover Eve, what would happen is the head of each household would go around the house and gather up all the, the leaven in the house and remove it before the Passover. In a sense, they sort of did what we call like a, a good <clears throat> spring cleaning of the house, as we say today. Yet we'll notice, even though that they will do this, it's interesting, no one was concerned about giving a thorough cleansing to God's house, to God's temple. And the reason for that is because the spiritual condition of Israel was at a low. Uh, the priests, the people, were very far from God at this point. Which, notice, is why John refers to this feast as the Jews' Passover. Notice that in verse 13. He says and calls it the Jews' Passover instead of what it was intended to be, which was the Feast of Jehovah. And the Lord is about to give the whole nation here a sign. Remember, that's John's word for the miracles, a sign. But this is a sign that he's about to give of a different kind. Not a miracle this time, but rather an act. An act that is worthy of a sovereign Messiah. And we see the Lord is going to go straight for their heart. Straight for the nation of Israel's heart. Straight for the religious leader's heart. Because we'll see him offering himself as the Messiah in the nation's capital we hear in Jerusalem. And yet he is going to be rejected. And he won't offer himself openly again as Messiah after this point in Jerusalem again until his final entry. But notice here. Jesus arrives at the temple... And he is, of course, noticing all that's going around him, what's taking place. He would have seen many Jewish pilgrims from all around the world that had traveled there to celebrate the Jewish feast. And what we need to understand is that because there were so many people that came, hundreds of thousands, uh, up to millions that would have come, this was an opportunity for those that lived there, that were the Jewish merchants, to make lots of money and to capitalize off of the foreigners or those that were traveling from out of town, out of the country. And they would capitalize. What they would do is they would set up shop, probably in the court of the Gentiles, and you would have vendors selling, as verse 14 indicates, oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers are sitting at their tables, we see. And so since many people traveled from long distances, if they were going to sacrifice the required animals for the sacrifices, they would have to buy animals. And so what the merchants would do is they would capitalize on this and they would take advantages, advantage of the pilgrims coming to Jerusalem here, and they would sell these animals uh, at ridiculously high prices and inflated prices. And then also on top of it, every male 20 years of age and older was required to pay 
what was known as the temple, the annual temple tax. And that was for the maintenance, the upkeep of the temple. But you could only pay using Jewish or Tyrian coins, one, because of the purity of the silver that was in those coins, but also because the other coins mainly had usually like an image of Caesar or the emperor or some heathen symbol, which they could not use to pay uh, for this, this uh, temple tax. And so in other words, the foreigners would have to go to them and have their money exchanged for these acceptable coins. And the money changers would again, not just change it in an even way, but they would charge an exorbitant amount uh, for their services. So realize that what the religious uh, leaders of this time uh, began as a service to the pilgrims and the foreigners under the corrupt rule of the chief priest basically had degenerated to exploitation, degenerated to usury, uh, to gain more money for themselves. So we see Jesus, he comes in to the temple area, and he is observing all this. He is observing that their worship indeed had become external. This is in God's house, God's temple. It had become crass. It had become materialistic. And as Matthew 21, verse 13 says, the temple of God had become a robber's den. Imagine what that did to his heart. This is the Son of God who's coming into the very temple. And so here Jesus approaches this and he comes into the temple grounds and he, he's surveying this and he sees that the temple has now been turned into basically some bazaar, some marketplace for profit. Jesus is appalled. Jesus is outraged at what is going on and what's happening here because what should have been a place, understand, for, for sacred reverence, what should have been a place for adoration of Almighty God had become none other than a religious market to make money. In fact, verse, seven, uh, verse 15 tells us, and when he had made a scourge of small cords, probably from those that were used to tie the animals. It says he drove them all out of the temple, the sheep, the oxen, and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables, verse 16, and said unto them that sold doves, take these things away, make not my father's house a house of merchandise, a place of business, in other words. I mean, you really got to... You've got to imagine this here. Here is Jesus alone, single-handedly cleansing the temple by himself. He is no doubt using strong force. He is creating this, this scene of pandemonium here in this temple court. I mean, just imagine it for a moment. You've got the animal sellers. They're running around chasing their animals. The animals themselves are chasing one another, <laughs> running around. Uh, the money changers are certainly startled, scrambling to pick up all their coins that are going all over. Uh, you have the temple authorities rushing to see what all the commotion is about. I mean, this is a pretty big scene. This is a disruption in the temple. Uh, by the way, Jesus was neither cruel, we know, to the animals, nor harsh to them. Anyone who's ever herded animals before understands that Jesus was simply using mild force here. Uh, he's not destroying anyone's property, it tells us. He didn't notice, he didn't release the doves. It says, for example, he told them instead to take these things away. But he did make it clear that he was in charge. He did make it clear that he was in command. Why? Because this was his father's house. And he would not have religious leaders coming in and polluting it and making money, making a business out of God's temple. You know, today we might say, as we look at this, this took place, for example, today in our day and age, people might say, Jesus, you need to be more loving. <laughs> Jesus, you need to be more accepting of others. 
Jesus, next time you need to maybe control yourself and your emotions a little bit better. Stop uh, discriminating from, from people. Those would be the words, the statements that they would have said to the Son of God. Yet we understand that the reason behind his intensity here and his fiery zeal of emotion was his righteous indignation for the Father. Christ would not and could not tolerate this from becoming some mockery of God. This irreverence of God, which was meant to be the true worship of the Father, of Jehovah for the Jews. And if anything shows us his passion for righteousness, if anything shows us his commitment to God and his holiness, and him identifying with the pain of his Father who was being dishonored, this is it. This description here. This shows his loyalty to the one and true God. This, this should be our loyalty as well while we live here on this earth. You know, we're loyal to our families, right? I mean, you, you can take a punch of me and slap me all you want. I, I can deal with it. But then when it becomes my wife <laughs> or my children, then that gets the blood going. And that's when you stop and you can't tolerate it anymore. This was Jesus. They're slapping God Almighty. They're abusing God through this fake worship. And even his reverence to God as being his father was a reminder both of his deity as well as his messiahship. So here we see the loyalty of the Son of God. And he's cleansing out the Father's house. So understand what he had just done was basically this. He had just overthrown an entrenched system of evil that had been continuing for years and years and years. And as he goes in, he claims himself to be the Son of God. And in a sense, he himself had gotten rid of the leaven of unrighteousness that was all in this temple area that had so long corrupted the nation. You can imagine the disciples. What are they thinking? Remember, they're still new to all this. They're standing by. Uh, they had just been, you know, gathered up by Jesus. And they're watching this, no doubt, in, in amazement. And uh, probably thinking, are, are we sure we're with the right guy? No. Uh, what have they been thinking? You wonder. Because they were still new to all this. And it no doubt made an impression on them. There's no doubt about it. And they're just watching him have this courageous zeal in the temple. And it says, notice, in verse 17, that comes to their mind, Psalm 69, verse 9. And his disciples, verse 17, remember that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. This is a messianic psalm, Psalm 69. It's a psalm of David when he was being persecuted. He was having zeal for the house of God. And this verse here in Psalm 69 actually pointed forward to Jesus Christ, who would experience and go through and have this fearless, this fearless action in the temple and his zeal for God, which would ultimately eventually lead him to death. Think about that. It was his zeal for God that brought him to the cross. It was his love. To do the Father's will that brought him ultimately to the cross of Jesus Christ. But do you know what the second half of that verse says in Psalm 69 verse 9? It says this. The reproaches of those who reproach you, David said, have fallen on me. Think about that. Paul the Apostle would use this in Romans chapter 15. To point toward the reproach that the church would experience time and time again. Because as Jesus said, since the world hates you, it hated me before it hated you. The reason that the world hates us is because they despise Jesus Christ. So don't take it personal. <laughs> the, the reason that we're persecuted, the reason 
why we are in a sense slept and treated and mistreated is because the reproach would fall upon us. That was upon Jesus Christ first. So we see tonight basically that the condition of the temple was really a clear picture of the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel. Think about that. Because really, in a sense, their religion was dull. It, it was just routine. It was about, you know, themselves. How can I make money? What can I do, you see, to, to, to get rich? You have all these, in the temple, these worldly-minded men just thinking about themselves, how they can make money. You know, how many churches and religions today are like that? Only the Lord knows their heart, obviously. But how many churches are doing things for uh, marketing reasons? How many churches and organizations and religions are putting together, uh, you know, booklets and, 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 you know, all sorts of things, videos for a Profit, not really doing it unto the Lord for his kingdom, but doing it to make money. There are many, there are many that are not truly dedicated to worshiping and reverencing the Lord. Look, the Lord would not tolerate them treating his father or the temple this way. And we also know that he will not in the future tolerate it as well. Because even though the Lord is patient, we're told, even though he is long-suffering, like 2 Peter chapter 3 says, the Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but he is actually patient toward you, not wishing that any perish, but for all to come to repentance. You say, Lord, all the evil and all the wickedness that exists today, I mean, why don't you just come and stamp it out? Stop it. They're making a mockery of your name. They're irreverencing you. Why not stop it? The Lord says, because I'm patient. I'm long-suffering. And I'm waiting for those to repent. That shows the Lord's love. That shows the Lord's care. To see many unsaved still in this day of ours come to repentance in Christ. To have a change of mind. And accept him in salvation. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 talks about that Jesus, he is the judge of all the earth. Several years later at the end of his ministry, Jesus is going to again do this very same thing. He's going to come in and cleanse the temple. So don't get these two accounts confused. But he'll do this action again. Later. But we also know that he's going to do it once again at his second coming, when he comes back. The Bible makes clear that out of his mouth, when he comes back this time, will be a sword in which he will judge the world and make war with them. And at that point, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord. And that he does deserve to be worshipped. In a holy manner, in a right manner. There's so much that we could draw from this passage, but I think what's clear is we see the Lord's love for his Father. And this love ought to just infect us and influence us in our own daily life, whatever it may be, wherever we're at, at work, at home, in our neighborhood. And to those we speak with, to show others, not a fakery, not a facade. Of some holy righteousness that we can't obtain. But to show them genuineness. To show them true love. To show them true devotion and commitment to God and to his word. To say this is what he's done for me. He's changed me. He's made me a new creation. Because that old Jesse, it's polluted. It's ruined. <laughs> There's nothing good in it. And I'm not going to live in that. As Paul said, not I, but Christ. And the life that I now choose to live, I live by faith every day 
moment by moment in the Son of God. You see, it's a continuous moment by moment trusting in Jesus to conform us to his image, to use us in that new nature. Not the old nature. That old nature is ruined. It's Adamic. It's from Adam. There's nothing good in it. Consider it dead. As Paul says, reckon it dead. Keep it where it belongs, but live in this new nature. The new nature is the life of Christ, the spirit that he gives to us. In that nature, we can live a life that is joyous, happy, exciting, thrilling, and loyal to the Lord in his word. Let's close with a word of prayer tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me just ask you in the quietness of your mind tonight, what is the Lord trying to say to you? Only you know your life. Only you are aware of all the intricate things that happen in your day. The people that speak to you, that talk to you, the family members, the neighbors, those at church, wherever you're at. What is it the Lord wants to communicate to you tonight? I think certainly one of those things is, is our heart loyal to Jesus? Is it loyal to God? Is it as loyal as Jesus was to the Son of, to the, the, to the Father in heaven, to where the Son of God could simply go into a place that was holy and yet do what he did? Why didn't they claim what he did as unholy? Well, because you see and understand that the fervor was his righteous indignation that he had for the Father. It's okay to be upset when it is upset for God. Be angry, the Bible says, and sin not. There's a way to communicate to the world that, no, that's wrong. Don't, don't use his name in vain. Don't, don't say it that way. You're talking about a holy, righteous God. In fact, the Bible says that every word that proceeds out of our mouth will be one day judged and will be held accountable for. Make sure that we're representing Jesus Christ in all that we say and all that we do. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Oh, Father, how much it speaks to our hearts. And Lord, it resonates deeply within us to show how much you love the Father. How much you cared for the, your heavenly Father in heaven. Father, you are willing to go to this extent. To make clear to all those that were around. That you indeed would not tolerate such things. And Father, you held the Father in high regard. And that he indeed needs to be worshipped in true holiness. That he needs to be adored as he is in the word that we have before us tonight. Lord, we pray that you would soften our hearts towards the truth. Lord, use us mightily in these days. Lord, not as uh, some Lord, fake, ungenuine type of Christian. Lord, use us mightily in a way that people would be turned on to you and to your word. That they would simply not see us, but see the reflection of you in our life. 